rock and roll. We're getting through this technology stuff. It is a process. So welcome, everybody. Delighted that you're here. And uh, Susan, if, if you're here, I uh, hope that doing a repeat from yesterday will uh, enhance the brain cells for the whole conversation. I'm not sure whether Jeannie shared this, but yesterday we blog talk was down. And we worked on Podbean, but it was kind of a fiasco. So decided to just uh, cancel that whole recording and start over. So we are working with the Enlightened book, what we've published so far from the Aramaic. And if you're new to the show, this is show number, I don't know, 26 or 27. And so we've got some history, and Jeannie's got a special page set up on the website to uh, to access this whole series that we're doing. And part of the series, or part of what I'm sharing in order to hopefully illustrate to people how to get into the mindset of the Aramaic, how to uh, get an attitude of mind going a la first century Aramaic instructions for how to keep the mind on track with truth and how to train the mind to support us living in actuality rather than living in the projections, the constructs of the mind. Well, that's basically where we're heading with this. And so I'm going to back up a little bit uh, from where we were the day before yesterday and just cover the last paragraph or two so we're in tune and then we'll just pick up from there. So I'm speaking to, to uh, Yeshua who's straightening out or giving us the tools for keeping the human mind in proper line, in, in proper operation. So in that conversation, I'm asking him about the, the way this whole thing works. What, what's the story? And he's explaining the mind. So he says, the human mind can justify and rationalize anything it wants to or decides to believe or do. So remember, we've talked about the Harvard research that says that in a time frame where 10,000 brain cells are firing, the max amount of data that goes into conscious awareness is nine bits. So the nine-bit mind, or metaphorically we're calling it that, is a device that gives us constructs based on what we ask it for. I mean, when you're looking at nine bits of data out of 20,000 brain cells firing, you're looking at, or 10,000, pardon me, brain cells firing, you're looking at evidence, no matter how you cut it. And so basically what the mind will do is it will give you evidence for anything you ask it to do, and its evidence will be whatever it's been structured to feed back to you. So, you know, if you think about a computer, and let's say I program the computer that 2 plus 2 equals 5. When I say 2 plus 2, the computer is going to swear up, down, right, left, center that 2 plus 2 equals 5, because that's what it's structured to do. So if I'm in some sort of corrupt data state of hostility or fear, and I've trained my mind that if I'm in pain, somebody else is the problem, my mind is going to literally hallucinate, literally create a construct that will show me that somebody else is the problem in my life. And for the average person who lives in that space, it doesn't matter if they've been through it 87 different times with 42 different people. The next time it happens, their mind will show them somebody else is the problem, and they'll actually believe it. And through it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, and this mind will not be able to figure out, oh, every time it happened, I was there. Maybe this has got something to do with me. You've got to start asking the mind for different evidence. So what Yeshua is saying is there are laws. Remember that our definition of the word law here in the Aramaic is not the rule of a superior, as the Greeks would tell us, but rather is simply an expression of the way things work. So what Yeshua is giving is the laws, the rules by which you govern your own mind. So he goes on to say, without knowing and following the rules to keep it, it on track, once the mind decides, only the only evidence that it feeds and supports in its decision will be seen through the mind. 
It is capable of blocking truth totally when it does that, no matter how obvious a particular fact is. If it's inconsistent with the mind's decisions that, based on goals, that fact becomes invisible. So once I tell the mind to t- or instruct the mind to show me that somebody else has a problem, how do I give? The- I've never in my life said, "Mind, show me that somebody else has a problem in my life." So, Michael, that just can't be true. Have you ever said they made me mad? Well, yeah, I got a hundred people who know how to make me mad. Are you sure? Or have you given your mind the instruction that somebody else makes you mad, so your mind always hallucinates evidence that somebody else is the cause of your mad? Guess what? Every time you've been mad, you've been there. It's about you. And not until you collapse the lie that you've been told to project your anger into your brain's image of everyone else, until you get that back on track, when, and, and in the laws of living, we used to teach a thing we called blockage of personal error. Yeah, for those who were in laws of living years ago, this is it's probably about 20 years ago we had the insight that that was an error way back then. But in the early days of laws of living, when Dan and I first put together laws of living and uh, emotional maturity instruction, we had in there a phrase blockage of truth, or pardon me, blockage of personal error. And then the insight came of, oh, wait a minute. Everybody sees their error perfectly. When I say you made me mad, I see that perfectly. And it is my error to think that you made me mad. But I see my error perfectly, but I call my error the truth. (laughs) So if I fill the nine-bit mind with a lie, I'm now living in blockage of truth. I see my error I call it the truth, and now the truth bounces off of me. If you don't get the mind on track with that, if you don't understand that, and you know it's interesting that there are still people out there who talk about, well, these old fogies in the desert, they didn't know anything 2,000 years ago. Oh, listen, if we only had a clue what that man taught. If we had a clue. I mean, something as simple as this. The mind is an evidential device. When the mind is giving you evidence, Yeshua spoke of it as appearances. He said, be careful, don't judge by appearances. Got to get your mind back on track. So once again, the mind is capable of blocking truth totally, and when it does, no matter how obvious the particular fact is, if it's inconsistent with the mind's decisions, based on your goals, that fact becomes invisible. It cannot be seen. It'll become your truth. So the mind will provide itself all the documentation it needs to make its conclusions justifiable, rational, and reasonable. The solution, Yeshua says, to this blockage of truth is honoring truth and following the protocol that I laid out. Remember, Yeshua gives us a protocol. The original title of this book was The 11 Most Important Words Ever Spoken. Why? Because it's a protocol for keeping the mind on track and teaching it to show you only the truth. Now, once you've got your mind showing you the truth, you still don't have an experience. You still don't have a live experience in the present moment through your mind. You only have the mind's replication. But if everything that the mind is feeding you is accurate, then the mind becomes a stepping stone into a live present moment. So Yeshua goes on to say, before the mind is used for anything, it needs this protocol, this methodology that will keep it on track to maintain its contact with truth. The mind is a wonderful servant, but a despicable master. In my answering to the lawyer, I gave the keys to keeping it in its proper place, that is, the mind. I was telling him the law and love are the mind's guide rails on the highway to reason. So the character that Yeshua was conversing with comes back with confusion. I don't understand. What do you mean, law and love are the guardrails on the highway to reason? Your confusion 
is a natural step in the process you're going through. You are building the brain cells, that is, the understanding is being integrated into your mind that will allow you to reach a new level of comprehension. With each step, new clarity will come and you will get closer to the understanding of my inner teachings, the message I came to deliver. Confusion is a necessary part of the process because your human mind has been trained into the ways of the world. Once steeped in the world, because being based in fear is completely backward, it takes time to convert the mind back to the ability to see truth. This is the real meaning of conversion. It is not about bringing a person into a religion, but about converting the fear-based mind back to harmony with its original design, a love-based mind. Remember that all hostility or fear in the mind says that that mind is using corrupt data to produce its constructs. So in this transformation, pardon me, process of transformation, Paul spoke, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, you'll notice that we have people who specialize in our world today in making sure you are conformed to the world. One of the main circles in which you see that happen is education, or pardon me, what's called education, what often passes for education that isn't education at all. Much of what we call our educational system is nothing but indoctrination, making sure kids' minds or the students' minds are conformed to this world. Oftentimes, theologically based teachings are totally and completely about conforming them to the belief system of the church. Rather than the space for discovery and experiencing truth, no, we're going to feed it to you in words and you better believe it. That's being conformed to this world. And what Paul was experiencing in that case was his own transformation and realizing that in order for that to have to, to happen, he had to change the way his mind was working. So Yeshua goes on to say, to the fear-based mind, the teaching on love sounds great, but it's more like a foreign language than a possibility. The world or secular mind is converted back to truth, thought by thought. This is the issue that was being addressed in Isaiah when he said, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people, yet they would not hear. So I pop in there as Yeshua presents this idea and say, certainly people would be delighted to hear directly from the Creator doesn't make any sense to me that God speaks with stammering lips and another tongue. Why would that happen? Well, projection. It is not that the Creator speaks with a tongue foreign to truth, but rather people have gone so far from truth, the truth itself sounds like a foreign tongue. To a mind whose God is hostility or fear. How do you tell if your your, your God is hostility or fear? When the stress is up and the chips are down, what do you turn to? Do you turn to hostility or fear-based perceptions? Or do you turn to the presence of love? If you turn to the presence of love, then your mind has been converted. Nice work. But it's pretty rare in our culture, especially in the extreme states, and I'll own this for me too, that that old hostility of fear still lurks under the surface, and it needs to be cleaned out. The brain cells to see it, Yeshua goes on to say, though it's in plain view, the key I gave is invisible. When you quoted my reply to the lawyer, you left out the single most important statement that I made in regard to the scriptures. So earlier we were talking about, you know, what's the most important passage? What's the most important um, key in 
this whole body of work that he's teaching. And, you know, the quote was, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. The second is like unto it, and your neighbor as yourself. So that was what was quoted back by this person who said, years of training in Scripture. And now Yeshua says, so notice that the keys in plain sight, I gave it to you. But then he holds him accountable. He says, you quoted my reply, but you left out the most important statement I made in regard to that issue. I was dumbfounded. I had heard and spoken his reply to the lawyer so many times I could quote it in my sleep, and I'm sure that I quoted it exactly as it appeared in the scriptures. I dared not utter my next thought. What are you talking about? And, as if he read my mind, which I'm sure he did, he made his point with crystal clarity. As the light of its meaning dawned by my mind, I was bathed in pure excitement. My most important words and the piece you missed were my next phrase. Quote, on these two commandments hang the law and all its prophets. This is the starting point for understanding all that I taught. And it seems that, as with many of my teachings, it's been well hidden. This is the protocol. And I did not tell people to love God or neighbor. I said to have rachma. This filter in your mind, this gateway, to keep it active and open so that love is present within you. And upon that hangs everything I taught. The urgency of understanding this instruction cannot be underestimated. Hidden? Why would you start? hide the starting point? I did not say I hid it. I only said it was hidden. Strangely, it's hidden right out in the open and blatantly obvious if you have the brain cells to see it. I, I, I don't... My words, words just trailed off. More confusion. Do you call what I said to my disciples and to you? It's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to others in parables, and seeing that they might not see and hearing that they might not understand? I nodded. My point is hidden because the person who's not yet met the criteria, the protocol for understanding the inner meaning of my words gets trapped in the first level, the outer meaning of my parables. They look for literal meanings in non-literal ideas and get lost there. I always spoke in parables. Literal interpretations do not, indeed cannot capture my intended meanings. I used parables to escape the blocks placed in the literal worldly mind to keep it from truth and to take people to the place where they could hear my deeper truths. Remember, without a parable, I did not speak to them. In my native language, Aramaic, my native culture, the word parable means parallel meaning. Your meaning, from the Greek, is close, para, beside, and bailing, to throw, to throw beside. The mind conformed to the ways of the world is only capable of hearing the outer, literal meaning of my teachings because it does not have the mindset, the brain cells, to understand the higher intended meaning. The meaning throw beside, that, that literal lower meaning. I see your confusion. It's perfectly normal at this stage of learning. Just stay with me. It's time to build the brain cells or my deeper meanings. I was always taught that every word of Scripture was literal and true. I can remember having the quote, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. pounded in my head. Fear. Well, no. Terror was used to reinforce the idea that everything was to be taken literally. No questioning allowed. Hell. There's been a continuous threat used to prevent questioning. 
That fear of being questioned is the behavior of an insecure, false authority. Those who do not truly understand cannot tolerate being questioned, and the level of violence in their threats betrays the level of their insecurity. The deeper the insecurity, the more violent are their threats. On the topic of your supposed scripture quote that's used to force belief in the scripture, would it surprise you to learn that the word is in that quote, as in all scripture is given by inspiration of God, would it surprise you to learn that that was added to the text? Check your history. It's not that long ago when the King James Version of the Bible was translated and all of the italicized words were added. I I protest. Now, not one, no one would dare to change one word of the scriptures. Well, he says, in my native Aramaic, that's true. Any copy or rendering had to be letter perfect. If one error was made, the scribe would have to begin the page again. This is just not so in the King James Version. Notice the difference in the meaning between all Scripture, the actual quote, all Scripture given by inspiration of God, and all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word is, is not in the original text or meaning. It implies an authority that many words or ideas in the scriptures simply do not deserve. Notice just a little earlier in Timothy, the admonition, study to show thyself approved unto the creator, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A workman. This means there's work for you to do instead of leaving it all on my shoulders. Take note that the work spoken of here is rightly dividing the word of truth. I did not say swallow everything whole without questioning. That's an idea that has come from false authority, who seems to represent me, but has not touched my real words, nor done the work required to follow me. But in Matthew 10.38, I said, And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. I meant that you had to take up and bear, that is, your cross, do the work that you needed to do. I broke in and said, I don't even know what that means. I don't know what you're talking about. Then he quoted Timothy 1.7. God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You are the light of the world, and your light should be put on a candlestick to shine before men, not hidden under a bushel basket. Satan, in Aramaic, is the resistor, one who misleads that the children of the Creator are so defective that our Mother Earth cried at the thought of us being here is a cleverly woven deception taught by wolves in sheep's clothing. It is a strand in the bushel basket designed to mislead us and keep our light, from, keep the light from our own minds and blind us with darkness. It is the thought contrived to continue the fraud that we are terribly defective when we are told clearly in Genesis, Creator created man in his own image. And the Creator has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Both thoughts cannot be true. Read my lips. Either the scripture's true or the men teaching this deception as doctrine are true. These are the deceptions spoken of in the Psalms. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hated thee have lifted up the head, and they have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against the hidden ones. They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against you. These teachings are designed to make us forget who we are. It 
Psalms 82, we said, deliver the poor and the needy, rid them of the, out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk in darkness. All of the foundations of the earth are out of course. Who are we, really? In Psalms 82.6, I have said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Rather than buy into the fraud that keeps us smaller than the Creator designed us to be, being blinded by those who harp on the idea that you're a helpless sinner instead of one with a mind of power and love, I support you following what I offered, my actual words, when I acknowledge that you will do greater works than I myself did. My meaning is simple. And one the weak and the codependent don't want to hear. Take up your cross is to deal with, that is removed from your temple, whatever it is that you hold within you that keeps from doing what I said. And you must follow that lead. To follow me is to do what I did and live the life I said was possible for you to live. Those who harp on the idea that you're a, that you're a helpless sinner instead of one, as I said, with the mind of strength and power, do not want you to believe that you can achieve what I said you could. Greater works than me shall you do. Because I go to my Father. You too must escape your perceptual mind and go to the actuality of the world where you will find the real source, your Father. I taught you how through a specific style of understanding to go to the Father. And so, Miss Jeannie, we're at about the halfway point, and we're getting ready to tap into what people call the Lord's Prayer. And so uh, I just want to open the gate to see if anyone has any questions, or is it making sense for everybody? Anywhere that you're seeing any conflicts that need to be resolved, questions, it would be natural if confusion were to surface, but... Do we have anybody in the phone queue with a hand up or anybody in the chat room that has a thought for us, Jeannie? There are no hands up and no questions in the chat room, and I'm really thrilled to see we've got six listeners on uh, on air on Podbean, and they say your voice awesome. is coming. Yep, and they say your voice is coming through really clear, so that's good. Knowing the microphone's picking it up, all right. Wonderful. So if anybody has a question. Uh, you can ask it in the chat room, and I'll read it to Michael, or press 1 if you're on Blog Talk. A hand will go up. Let me know that you want to ask something. Or if you're in Blog and Talk's or, chat room. Yeah, and or if you're on one of those stations where we can't see you, if you call into the, the call-in line directly, you'll be listening to the show on your phone. The call-in number is 563-999-3581. If you call that number, you'll be listening to the show. And then if you push one, that'll raise a hand in the control panel, and we'll know you want to talk to us, and Jeannie will introduce you. So if you have any thoughts, we would love to hear them. We now have a, a hand up. Time before we move. Great. Let's go for it. And it's Miss Terry Woods. We haven't heard from her in a while. Oh, my goodness. Hey, well, I'm there. Um, yes, good morning. Long um, time. Michael? Yes, several years. Uh, Michael, are you reading from the Kabbalah? Well, actually, uh, 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 let me let me clarify. So, so we've published a book called Enlightenment from our translations of the Kabbalah. So that's the only work that's been published so far. So we started the study of okay. that 27 or 28 sessions ago on the radio show. So Jeannie's got a special okay. page on the website for the archives of that. One of the pieces of work that I did, uh, going back about 22 or 23 years ago, uh, Dan McDougald and I were teaching a Laws of Living course, which is a course we developed out of the Kavor's manuscript. And during that, that particular class, which I've taught oh, probably, mm, I don't know, 60 times over the years, 
during that particular class, I had a, a major like knockdown opening when I recognized the import of those words, for upon this hangs the law in all the prophets. And I started to write a book entitled The Most, 11 Most Important Words Ever Written. And, in, and I've explained this earlier in, in one of the earlier sessions, if you go back and listen. But at one point, due to touching into some, as I was writing, some of the trauma of my own early childhood, I realized that this whole explanation was really about how on a practical level to end suffering. So what I did is I, I, I pulled out my writing from The End of Suffering, which was originally called The 11 Most Important Words Ever Spoken, and started to read that. So we're in the process of reading that as part of our work with the Enlightenment book, which again is what we published so far from the uh, Kaboras. I have not published this book yet. This is the closest I've come to publishing it. And uh, I'm, I actually had set it aside uh, several years ago due to a number of reasons. And now with pulling it back out, I'm back on working on it and uh, getting ready to publish it. But at this point, it is not published work yet except in this audio uh, series that we're doing. Okay, that, that was my nice question. <laughs> yes, yes, it did. I've been um, listening to the show for a couple of weeks now, two, three weeks, off and on, um, sometimes the first half, sometimes the second half. And, um, yeah, I joined the uh, support group last night for the first time, which was lovely. Awesome. So uh, jumping back into this work. Well, delighted to have you here. Any questions along the way, we're delighted to have you step in and, and ask those questions. Uh, you're aware we have now the World's Only Forgiveness app? I think I may have heard you mention that before, and I okay. may have downloaded it. Well, but you know, I'll, the worksheet will, process, yeah. yeah, if you just go to your uh, your app store on your phone, whichever system you've got, and type in the words Heartland, one word, H-E-A-R-T-L-A-N-D, Aramaic Forgiveness. You can download the app free. It's a, an extremely private app. It only asks basically for one permission in order to use it. It doesn't ask if we can dial your phone or access your contacts or change your settings or it doesn't do any of that stuff. It's just the simple uh, permission to allow it to use the Internet so it can function. And then when you do a worksheet, you have the option of printing it as a PDF, and of course, to do that, you have to save it somewhere, so there is a second permission asked to, to uh, save that file if you want to save your work, but otherwise, there are no permissions, so you know, we realize that people put sensitive information into their worksheets, and you can trust that you're the only one that's ever going to be able to find it or see it. Okay, yes, I do believe I did download that app, so I will uh, cool. peek in there and open it up. Awesome, and yeah, when it work, it's when it asks to save it, it only saves it to your device, nowhere else. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't go to the cloud or anything. It's just to your phone. And if you if you want to start using it, if you go to to our Y Again website, whyagain.org, in the upper left hand corner, there's a, little, a button that says Start Here. If you click that. Jeannie has done about what is it about a thirty minute video on how to use the app. So that'll be a that'll be a good oh, yeah. starting point to just I mean most people you can do it and it's pretty intuitive, but you'll get the refinements by watching that thirty minute link under the start here on our website. Yes, I'm there now. I see it. Very good. Cool. All right. awesome. well, thank you. Thank you for all your guidance. Delight to hear support. from you. All right. Yes, I'm sure I'll be Have calling in the one. questions. Thank Please you. do. Please do. That's that's the the most important part of the show is the interaction, the questions that help us to clarify and really open new spaces in, in our process. Because of course this is you know, we're here teaching what we're teaching as part of our process as well. And uh together we all get to move forward in greater and greater ways. Yeah. So yeah, it's beautiful. Delighted you're it. with us. All right, Derek, blessings. Dave. Alrighty, bye bye. Okay, Miss Jeannie.
Do we have anybody else? There are no other hands up and no questions in uh, pod B. Okay, cool. So let's look into what the world calls the Lord's Prayer. Um, there are notes on the website that you can access, and I'm actually going to run through those notes uh, as part of what we're doing so you get the, the full import of what this set of instructions means. And when you go to the Aramaic, you find that it's not a prayer at all. But let me just unfold it according, along with the notes, so this will follow along. You can access those notes yourself. So this rendition of the Lord's Prayer is not so much a translation as it is following the instructions Yeshua gave regarding prayer. The Aramaic language of Jesus is a right brain language. As such, it is unlike our left brain language, which attempts to capture literal meanings as though the actuality of a thing can be seized by words. Literal is not a word that can be attached to a right brain statement. Yeshua tells us, quote, pray in this way, not say these words. He specifically says, do not recite and repeat. To recite and repeat means memorization coming from the head, the intellect, which defeats the purpose of prayer. Yeshua's instructions were that we should instead, quote, understand with the heart Prayer in Aramaic is to set a trap, or translates to set a trap for God. To understand this Aramaic idiom, one must have some idea, not of translation, but of meaning. To set a trap for God is an idiom for becoming the space for, or becoming in tune with. In other words, he was giving us a pattern, not literal words to say, to become the space where the love of God reflects or is trapped or captured and reflected into the world. To understand, understand that, think about the TV antenna on your roof. It captures the signal from channel 2, and if it's aligned properly and oriented properly, you get a clean picture and good sound. If it is out of alignment, then the picture and the sound are compromised been called the Lord's Prayer is not a prayer at all, but a set of, set of instructions for how to align yourself. Where in effect told there's only one prayer, the result of which produces the cause of everything that's needed, seek before the council you know, that's spoken of by the Greeks as the kingdom, the council, the wisdom, and the love of the Creator and everything else will be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. What Yeshua was saying there, in effect, is become the space of love first, for out of that, all that you want will, be, will come. Yeshua tells us he's not giving us words to repeat like drones, but a sense of the kinds of things that will produce the result of becoming that space which reflects love and produces a fulfilled life. He specifically says, and when you are praying, do not recite and repeat like the pagans. Their goal is to be heard for much talking. Do not be like that. For the Creator knows what is needed before you ever ask. He's informing us that prayer is not about having your list fulfilled. It's not about putting your order into the cosmic gift catalog. In essence, forget the list, become the space. He's giving, giving instructions for how to function as a true human being. He makes the point that we are offspring of one source, as he speaks of our father, not his father. The essence of everything that Yeshua taught is encapsulated in one set of words as he gives instructions in five categories that are needed, five areas of attention to become the space of love on earth. 
One is acknowledgement. One is worship. And worship means to emulate. Doesn't mean get down on your knees. To emulate. If you want to if you really want to be the expression you're designed to be, then align with and function out of the presence of love. One of the things we'll get into later in this is the Aramaic Beatitudes. And in the Beatitudes, once again, you don't have a, um, a set of, uh, uh, pardon me, a, a nice philosophy. You have a set of instructions for how to align yourself to bring forward the highest guidance system that's within every one of us but has been shut down by the world. So first you have the acknowledgement, worship, and then acknowledgement, appreciation, then acknowledgement, forgiveness. And notice the acknowledgement that's in there. Our work, our part in the forgiveness process that heals and preserves the space of love in us. And then the final part, fifth part of that set of instructions is, once again, acknowledgement, appreciation, and the request to keep us apart from error and be a receptive space for this presence of love. So what's been called the Lord's Prayer is a practical how-to of living as love. When spoken with the goal of attunement to our true nature, with sincerity and reverence, this set of words will help to empower you to be the space of love that is your essential nature, the being you were created to be. It is faithful to the instruction Yeshua gave and addresses the issues that need to be dealt with within our culture in order to produce the space of love that is so needed in ourselves, our homes, our country, and our world. So this that I'm about to share with you from from the book, uh, The End of Suffering, or the five most, 11 most important words ever spoken, is not meant to be a translation. It's an interpretation adjusted for the difference in our culture compared to Yeshua's culture 2,000 years ago. So we've updated it to be what, what would we need to hear in this culture to get a parallel meaning in a much more com- complicated world than he gave these instructions in 2,000 years ago? So the instruction set, not a prayer, but the instruction set, our eternal creator, parent to us all, who's in the realms of the unmanifest, teach us to honor, worship, and serve you. Now, what, what, who is the you we're talking about here? Ultimately, it's incomprehensible. You know, to think that we can reduce, and I think this is one of the reasons why, for instance, in the Hebraic language, you, you can't speak the name of the Creator, because to do that is to reduce it. And for us to, to attempt to comprehend the Creator... I think is very much like an ant looking at a mountain with a ski resort on it and under, trying to understand skiing. It's like just not going to happen. So teach us to honor, emulate, and serve the presence of love in the world. Let your counsel, your wisdom, and your love come alive in us. Attune us to and empower us to conceive of and understand the will that you've already created for us. And teach us so that we may give birth to its fruit. Implicit in that is the awareness that you have a purpose. Now, each of us is brainwashed by the world, and we're taught that our purpose is to be a good commercial servant. This is not your purpose. And uncovering your purpose is a really important piece of work to do. We actually do a whole workshop called Purpose, Personal Power, and Commitment. That you renew and feed us daily with the presence of your love, the love of each other, and the food we receive is a gift we gratefully accept. Thank you for restoring us to abundance 
teaching us to give as you give and presence love as you are the presence of love for both the just and the unjust. That's such a key because what this whole teaching is about is maintaining your human life above all. And you do that by following the protocol, Rachma, gateway in the frontal lobes of the brain that do two things. It is the doorway through which love, your created spiritual essence, enters your form. Your form has its own understanding of who you are, a false self. Yeshua said that self has to die in order for us to live. And by taking up your cross, by taking up whatever is based in hostility or fear in your family, genetic, or your own personal or cultural experience, and removing those things is key. Being the space of love. Then comes appreciation again. Thank you for restoring us to abundance, teaching us to give as you give, and presence love as you are the presence of love, for both the just and the unjust. That you forgive from us those realities that have been we have pardon me that we have engaged in that do us harm and do not belong in our humanness is another of your blessings we appreciate. We commit to responsibility and forgiving as to those painful realities that others trigger in us. To, to fall out of harmony with your love. That you are still there with us, being the space of love. That your love is always present no matter how far we fall. No matter where we go is a blessing we gratefully accept. Just a slight shift from lead us not into temptation, as the Greeks would tell us. That with your grace, you deliver us from our errors, and through your light, part us from darkness is another blessing that flows from your divine presence. We receive each of these gifts with gratitude and praise, sealed in trust, faith, and truth. Amen. Amen. I'm breathing with you. What I'm guided to do at this moment is invite you to get into a quiet space and let's go through this. So we've got the brain cells for it. Let's go through this now as a meditation. And so if you would, I'm going to just invite you to take a couple of deep breaths. Close your eyes or if you're in a position where you can do that, where it's safe to do that. If you're driving a car, we're not wanting you to do that or <laughs> listening to this while you're at the office or what have you. But if you're in a place where you can, I'm going to invite you to just close your eyes, get quiet. And one of the things that physics, physics is telling us is that space and time are irrelevant. They're really fabrications of the mind. And so what I'm going to invite you to do is to use your imaginative faculty. This is one of the spiritual faculties that when strengthens, empowers us to live in actuality rather than be limited to what the constructs are, the perceptions of the mind. And I'm going to invite you to imagine that you breathe yourself back in time 2,000 years. Imagine that you're sitting on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and you're not listening to my voice. Actually allow yourself to attune to this man that had the most phenomenal presence of love that any of us have ever experienced. Imagine you go back in time and you're actually sitting there comfortably listening as he gives you this set of instructions on how to be the space of love, how to pray. Remember again, the word prayer in Aramaic means to set a trap for God. 
Here are the instructions for how to orient and align yourself so that you literally, physiologically incarnate in your form as love. Displacing and working through everything that would block that. And so I'm going to mention, ask you to just take a couple of deep breaths. I'll take a couple with you, and then let's imagine we're sitting there listening to his voice share these instructions. And you're sitting with his presence that knows these instructions so thoroughly that they just totally and completely energetically are received by every cell in your structure. Our eternal creator, parent to us all, who is in the realms of the unmanifest, teach us to honor, worship, and serve you. Let your counsel, your wisdom, and your love come alive in us. Attune us to and empower us to conceive of and understand that will which you have already created. Teach us that we may give birth to your fruit. That you renew and feed us daily with the presence of your love, the love of each other and the food we receive, is a gift we gratefully accept. Thank you for restoring us to abundance, teaching us to give as you give, and presence love as you are the presence of love for both the just and the unjust. And as you breathe, you might just take a moment now and think of anyone in your world or in the world at large that seems to be unjust. Can you breathe into and presence love for that individual, however ornery or despicable they might appear to be? Can you imagine yourself bringing love to your interaction with that individual? That's what this passage means. Because when you can do that, nobody can take your human life from you again. If someone can allow arouse rage, fear, hatred, vengeance in you, then they can blot out your human life by resonating that in you. If you do the work of forgiveness, and you go inside yourself and remove those energetic patterns, then you will maintain your human life no matter what anyone does. doesn't mean you have to lay down and take it. doesn't mean you don't hold people accountable. But to maintain your human life, you have to be aware of it and hold it in existence, in awareness with you, no matter what happens in your world then you are truly human. So once again, imagine yourself in that space where your true powerful being as a presence of love is fully in expression in every cell of your structure. And in gratitude, and in, in even deeper than gratitude, in appreciation, Thank you for restoring us to abundance, teaching us to give as you give, and presence love as you are the presence of love for both the just and the unjust. That you forgive from us those realities we've engaged in that do us harm and do not belong in our humanness is another of your blessings we appreciate. We commit to responsibility and forgiving as to those painful realities that others trigger in us. When we are tempted to fall out of harmony with your love, breathe that you are there with us, that you are here with us, being the space of love,
that your love is always present no matter how far we fall, no matter where we go, is a blessing we gratefully accept. That with your grace, you deliver us from our errors. And through your light, part us from darkness. It's another blessing that flows from your divine presence. We receive each of these gifts with gratitude, appreciation, and praise sealed in trust, faith, and truth. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Deliver that love to the world through your form and have the best year yet of your eternal life. It's an honor.